Hey everybody, it's Angie and welcome to Hot and Flashy. Today's video is going to be the second video of my new anti-aging ingredients series. If you missed the first one, it was on the retinoids and I'll put a link to it here. Actually, I'll put a link to the playlist. Now that there are two videos, I can make a playlist out of it. Um, so that whether you're seeing this video on the first day it goes up or if you're seeing it a year from now, you can click on the playlist to see all the videos in the series. I'm going to be covering everything from retinoids to peptides to sunscreen, which is the topic of today's video. So I started off the series by featuring the retinoids, which are the most potent, the most effective ingredient that we have for reversing the signs of photo aging. That's another word for sun damage. So that's why this video is on sunscreen, which is the most potent, the most effective ingredient that we have to prevent the signs of sun damage or photo aging. So did you guys know that 80% of the visible signs of aging that you see on your skin, the wrinkles, the sagging, the age spots, are due to UV exposure? Well, that's what the research has found. And um, when I mention research through this video, I will be linking every like kind of stat that I give you in the information box below so that you can go there and read it for yourself. So here's some more stats for you. Research published in 2015 showed that only 18% of US men and 42.6% of US women use sunscreen on their faces on a regular daily basis. So that's that's not too many. That's the minority in both cases. Obviously, women are doing much, much better because they're more concerned about aging. We also have the stigma that as we age, we don't get better like men do, which is completely unfair. But then what was interesting is that for the rest of the body, sunscreen use actually went up in men, not much, from 18 to 19 percent. Woohoo! But it actually went down, though, in women, which was kind of a bummer for the body um, because, of course, the skin on your body ages as well, as you know. Um, but it went down to 34.4%, so over a 10% drop. So ladies, if you're concerned with aging on your face, you should be just as concerned with it on the rest of your body. I always recommend in all my sunscreen videos to not only put your sunscreen on your face, but also to put it on your neck, your chest, and the backs of your hands every single day, and also on every inch of exposed skin. But even though I'm indoors today and it's snowing out, I am still sunscreened up every inch of my exposed skin because of course my house has windows. <laughs> I go into my kitchen, there are UVA rays in there that are bouncing off of surfaces and hitting my skin and causing aging. And this is one of the least understood parts about UV radiation is that there are actually a number of different types of UV rays. There's UV a, there's UVB, there's UVC, and there's actually a couple more. But the two that we're mainly concerned about for the skin are UVA and UVB. And when sunscreens were developed, um, they were pretty much trying to mitigate the sunburn that you get because it hurt and turned your skin red. Um, but that was mainly caused by the UVB rays, which are shorter, they don't penetrate as deeply into your skin, and you can feel them on your skin. That's where you get that nice warm feeling from the sun is from the UVBs. Over the years, what they realized is that UVA is a more dangerous ray because not only is it penetrate deeper into your skin, it causes more of the aging, it causes more of the skin cancers, and unlike UVB, which is um, weaker at certain times of year and at certain times of the day, UVA is the same strength all year round and all day long. It comes through windows, it comes through clouds, so even on a cloudy day, 70 to 80 percent of that those UVA rays are still making it through the clouds, are still hitting your skin. Aside from aging, the other thing that the radiation does cause is skin cancer. And the World Health Organization has classified UV radiation as a known carcinogen, okay? So this is not news that sunshine causes skin cancer. More than five sunburns in a lifetime doubles your risk of melanoma, and melanoma is serious, deadly skin cancer. So when I look back on my childhood, back then that, you know, the highest SPF they had was a four anyway, and it was only for protecting you from UVB rays, nothing for UVA. I am concerned about skin cancer in my lifetime, and so when I stopped roasting my skin in the sun, which was about 15 years ago, I started taking it seriously. I know there are people who think that sunscreen is toxic and you shouldn't use it and it's bad for you and you need vitamin D and all this other stuff, but you know, you guys, skin cancer is real. I have heard of death by skin cancer and I'm sure you have too. And if you've had skin cancer, then you know what a serious disease it is. 
I have never heard of death by sunscreen, okay? So I'm just putting that out there for you. If you disagree with me, that's fine. There are other sources of vitamin D. Uh, I take a multivitamin, I eat a lot of salmon, I eat a lot of dark leafy greens, which are great sources of vitamin D, and I have my vitamin D checked every year. And guess what? My vitamin D levels are in the normal healthy range, smack dab in the middle, not even on the low side. So I am good where vitamin D is concerned. And I know that, you know, vitamin D, if you don't have enough of it, can be a problem. So I'm not discounting that, but I'm just saying if you are gonna go into sunscreen, you should probably have your vitamin D checked. Make sure that you take a supplement and, um, you know, eat foods that can help to get you more vitamin D into your diet. As with everything, I want you to know that I'm not a doctor, I'm not a dermatologist, I'm not a chemist. I am a user of the products like you. I'm someone though who likes to do my research. I like science, I like studies, like double-blind peer-reviewed studies, I like medical journals, I like talking to doctors. So that's where my information comes from. So let's just talk about the differences between the US in sunscreen and Europe and Asia in sunscreen. Here in the US, the FDA regulates the sunscreen ingredients as drugs. Because of that they have to go through really rigorous testing and unfortunately the FDA has not approved, um, except for one, any new sunscreening ingredients in 12, 15 years, something like that, since the late 90s. I mean it's kind of ridiculous the way that the rest of the world is passing us by. In Europe and Asia, sunscreens are regarded as cosmetics, so they don't have quite as rigorous testing, but they do still have guidelines and testing that they need to go through to make sure that they do work and that they do screen the sun. So here in the U.S. we have less than 20 uh, sunscreening ingredients that are approved for use. In Europe they have more like 29 to 30 sunscreening ingredients that are approved, and in Asia there's more like 40. I can't go through all of them here today. I will just touch on the main ones. So let me put up a little graphic here. Here are the main sunscreen ingredients that are approved for use here in the United States. The reason they're in two groups is because on this side are the mineral sunscreens and on this side are the chemical sunscreens. So the main differences in the sunscreening ingredients is which parts of the UV spectrum they screen and whether they are absorbed into your skin or whether they sit on the surface and the rays bounce off of them. So the two over here are the ones that mainly sit on the surface and they reflect the rays off of your skin and that's how they protect you from the sun. So the first one here is zinc oxide. This is the only mineral sunscreen that screens the entire UVA and UVB spectrum. UVA is actually broken up into two parts of the spectrum. That's UVA1 and UVA2. So zinc oxide actually screens UVB, UVA1, and UVA2. So it is considered a full broad spectrum sunscreen. So that is like the gold standard, the best that you can get. Um, but it is a mineral sunscreen which in the past, they have been very inelegant. Think of that white zinc that you would see on the lifeguard's nose. That's zinc oxide. Fortunately, over time, they have figured out how to formulate it so that they don't leave you white, don't leave you shiny, play well with your makeup and everything so you can use them every single day, and I will have recommendations for you in a minute. So zinc oxide is photostable, and it's less likely to cause irritation than a lot of these chemical sunscreens on this side. Titanium dioxide is as well photostable and less likely to cause irritation, but titanium dioxide doesn't screen the whole spectrum. It leaves out UVA1, so it only screens UVB and UVA2. So if you see a sunscreen that just has titanium dioxide on the label, I wouldn't use it. I want the full uh, spectrum to be screened. So if it has just zinc oxide on the label, that is good. Or a mix of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide is also good. Then you're getting the full broad spectrum protection. Okay. Now I'll put a link here to my video with the best all mineral sunscreens that I've tried over the last three years of testing that I've done. I've tried oh, probably over a hundred all mineral sunscreens. Let me just show you my couple of favorites briefly here. My favorite one from my video last year is this Australian Gold Botanical Tinted Face SPF 50. This one is a mix of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. It's a tinted sunscreen and it's a thick thicker cream, but it really works nicely on your skin. It actually acts kind of like a primer or a little bit of a smoother uh, for if you have enlarged pores. It's great for oilier skin because it does absorb oil 
and it can be a little bit drying so if you have dry skin I would not recommend this one but this is a great one that I use just about every single day and another one that I use all the time just about every day and I actually mix it with this one is this hydropeptide solar defense this is an SPF 50 this is a white cream it's um, not as thick as that one it actually goes on your face really nicely it leaves no white cast it is slightly shiny but it works great under makeup again it has almost like a little smoothing effect on the pores and stuff so that one is fantastic fantastic. Um, one that I'm trying right now and really loving for my sunscreen video for this year that'll be out in May is this one by Makeprem UV Defense Me Blu-ray Sun Cream. This is SPF 50 plus PA plus 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 plus. This is a Korean sunscreen but it is a mix of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. The SPF is the UVB coverage. The PA is the UVA coverage. So it runs from a single plus to four pluses is the most that you can get. So this one is the highest uh, level of UVA coverage. So this is a really good one. This one is even thinner in consistency than the hydropeptide. It glides on the skin beautifully. It doesn't leave a white cast. It's not shiny. Um, it's just great under makeup. So far I am really loving it. Okay, let's move over here to the chemical sunscreen side. I haven't used chemical sunscreens in a few years because of the irritation. When I started using retinoids and using glycolic acid and vitamin C, I was using a chemical sunscreen and what I found was that as soon as I put my sunscreen on every day, I would feel this burning around my eyes and my research led me to the mineral sunscreens. So if you have had irritation from your sunscreen, try a mineral sunscreen. It may work for you. I have this handy dandy reference chart. This will also be linked in the information box below the video. This is what I'm gonna be uh, using to talk about the chemical sunscreens. One of the ones that you'll see on most US standard sunscreens is avobenzone. This ingredient only screens UVA1, so not broad spectrum on its own, which is why you always see like four or five different sunscreening ingredients on chemical sunscreens. You know, you could also mix chemical with minerals, so sometimes you'll see zinc oxide mixed with some chemicals, and that's fine too. Avobenzone is very photo unstable, so you put it on your skin, and as it absorbs the light, it breaks down. And so the longer you wear it, the less effective it is, which is why then the guidelines are to reapply every two hours. So another one of the less stable sunscreening ingredients is the next one, homosalate. This one only screens UVB. It does degrade somewhat in sunlight. Another one that you'll see commonly combined with those guys is octinoxate. This is another one that screens only UVB and also degrades in sun sunlight. So then you have to add other things that help them to not break down when exposed to sunlight, like octocrylene. It's, it's photostable and it helps to stabilize other ingredients and it screens UVB and UVA2. Oxybenzone screens for UVB and UVA2 and it is photostable and helps to uh, stabilize other UV filters. Octosalate is a UVB screener and it does break down a little bit in sunlight so it needs those stabilizing factors as well. And Sulazole is a newer ingredient but I don't see it on many labels I gotta say. That screens UVB and UVA too and it doesn't degrade very much in sunlight but it does need more study to really be used widely. And then a newcomer here in the US, probably the most recent thing that has been approved, is called Mexoral SX. This screens for UVA1 and UVA2. It is photostable. It's FDA approved, but on a very limited basis, so only a couple of companies are allowed to use it. And the last one on the FDA approved list is Muratamite, which uh, screens for UVA2, a sunscreen with a mix of mineral and chemical sunscreens that's available here in the US is the CeraVe AM Facial Moisturizing Lotion. This one is an SPF 30, so a little bit less. So this one has the zinc oxide in it and then it has four other chemical sunscreening ingredients. This is a nice moisturizer to use on a daily basis. And then for a all chemical sunscreen that I used to use and love, that was the Neutrogena Ultra sheer liquid sunscreen. This is an SPF 70 broad spectrum. This is a beautiful sunscreen to use under makeup. It's super thin, runny, like fluidy kind of thing. It absorbs right in. All right, so let's look at some of the European sunscreens that are available. The first one is Tinsorb. This one is a full broad spectrum sunscreen covering UVB, UVA1, and UVA2. It's very photostable and it is 
not approved here in the US, but it is available in Europe, Australia, and other countries. Then we have Tinsorb M, which again, full broad spectrum, UVB, UVA1, UVA2, um, shows little photo degradation, so pretty photo stable, apparently not as good as Tinsorb S. A Mexoral XL, which we have the Mexoral SX version here in a couple of sunscreen brands. Uh, that one is a UVA2 sunscreen, and it is photo stable. Here is Juvenal T150. This is a UVB sunscreen. It is insoluble in water, so I guess it will be a good water resistant one. Juvenal A Plus is a UVA2 sunscreen. It's photo stable. There's Uvasorb HEB, which is a UVB and UVA1 sunscreen. Parsol SLX, which is a UVB sunscreen. So some of the sunscreens that contain the European or Asian sunscreen ingredients that I've picked up through my travels or on the internet um, that I really like are the ISDIN Photo Protector Fusion Water 50 Plus. This one I got when I was in Spain a couple years ago. I love this one and it works really great under makeup. Another one is the Shiseido Anessa Perfect UV Sunscreen Aqua Booster Mild for sensitive skin SPF 50 Plus PA++++. When I first got this one I thought it was all mineral um, of course, because as usual, can't read the ingredients, but unfortunately it is not. It is a mineral chemical combination. This one is great. It's a really nice um, fluid liquid. This one actually leaves a slight white cast, so it's good to use under makeup, not so much on its own. Then um, another one that I have tried and really like is this um, Etude House Sun Prize Mild Airy Finish SPF 50 plus PA++++. This is a really nice sunscreen that leaves no white cast, no shine, but this one is very high in SD alcohol. I believe it's the second or third ingredient, which I think can be drying on older skin, so I kind of like to stay away from those. So this one I don't use that often, but if you have super oily skin, you may really like this one, or it could work for you. Who knows? So yep, the topic of sunscreen can be controversial. It's very complicated. Formulating them is very complicated, but I think that, um, you know, through this discussion of sunscreen ingredients, what I'm trying to illustrate is that when whether you use a standalone ingredient that is a superstar ingredient that is full broad spectrum on its own is stable, or whether you want to use a combination of a number of different sunscreening ingredients, that there's something out there for you. No matter where you fall on the sunscreen use or trust spectrum, there's something that you can find uh, to use. And so I think it's worthwhile to use it from an anti-aging and from a health standpoint. So that's it for today's video, everybody. I hope you found it helpful and informative. If you did, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. As always, I thank you so much for your time and really appreciate your watching, especially a long one like this. So take care and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.